welcome to news click it has been one year since the abrogation of article 370 in kashmir and one year since the statehood of jammu and kashmir was revoked to talk about this we have with us dr radha kumar who was formally appointed as an interlocutor by the center to kashmir in 2010 and we will be discussing with her the current situation in kashmir after many promises were made by the amit shah narendra modi duo of you know development prosperity for the citizens of Kashmir when this move was passed, but what really is the situation today? To talk about this, we have with us Dr. Radha Kumar. Thank you for joining us today. Thank um, you. So to start with, can you talk about just the present situation in Kashmir in terms of the health, the education, and the livelihoods of people? How, have, how has that been affected by all these different kinds of lockdowns that have been in place first due to the August First, the August 4 lockdown, then, then the COVID lockdown. So while uh, the report that uh, you're also a part of the forum on for human rights in Jammu and Kashmir, which recently published its report on the, on the impact of the lockdown in Kashmir, what were the sort of findings that came out in the process of compiling this report on the situation right now? Well, the first, I think, uh, finding was how a whole series of human rights, uh, from habeas corpus to the right to bail, to the right to a speedy trial, to uh, protections against uh, arbitrary arrest, uh, to the rights of children not to be arrested. Uh, all of these were violated uh, uh, from August 4th onwards. Um, what we did find uh, and there was very little recourse uh, uh, in the sense that the courts took a very, very long time uh, on any of these uh, petitions on habeas corpus or bail. Uh, and in that sense, one might say that uh, really you can say that those rights were denied even by the courts, uh, which is a sad situation. Um, we also found that uh, you have people in India perhaps don't realize that what we're talking about is in effect one year of lockdown in in uh, what used to be a state uh, of the country, uh, and obviously if you have one year uh, of a lockdown, you are going to have terrible impacts on the economy, on health, and on education. Um, looking at industry, estimates that have come out of the valley, for example, from the Kashmir Chamber of Commerce and Industry, indicate that there could be a loss of as much as 40,000 crore across all sectors of the industry. Uh, obviously, the most severely affected were also those that contributed a very large uh, proportion of the GDP uh, of the state, the fruit industry, the tourism industry, services, uh, all of these were severely impacted. Smaller uh, industries like handicrafts or information technology, many, many companies, especially startups, were forced to go out of business. Um, <clears throat> in the March budget, we did not see any allocations for compensations for these losses. Uh, and these losses were not due to natural disasters, but due to man-made. Uh, a disaster. Um, on health, uh, we saw interestingly that, uh, that, that the impact on health could be divided into two phases. The first phase being the first, say, two to three months uh, from August 4th to, let's say, October, uh, when, uh, you know, communications were snapped, when Section 144 was imposed, when no one could uh, go uh, to the hospital uh, and when you could not speak to your doctor on the telephone, uh, clinics were closed, pharmacies could not uh, deliver medicines, uh, vital medicines did not arrive at pharmacies. Uh, already news reports have indicated that several people died in that period just for lack of access to healthcare. And that's really uh, very shocking. Um, the COVID uh, lockdown, by contrast, was uh, allowed some movement. 
people could go to hospitals, even though on average it took three or four times the amount of time uh, to get to a hospital compared to pre-August uh, 2019. Um, but still, doctors had terrible difficulties. They could not keep up with the latest information and research on the pandemic and methods of dealing with it. Uh, nurses could not attend even government conferences uh, digitally uh, because of the restriction to 2G networks. Um, patients who spoke to their doctors uh, were not able to visually explain uh, what their ailment was. So across all categories, you saw uh, a, a negative, a severe negative impact on healthcare. Uh, <clears throat> education was one of the major sufferers. First, uh, post the lockdown, schools were closed. Uh, then when they were opened, it was very difficult for parents to send their children to school because they couldn't communicate with them on the phone, they couldn't check on them, uh, they couldn't communicate with the school. Uh, and that was a risk that obviously most parents were not willing to take, as I would not be either. Um, when things began to improve slightly and some movement was allowed, uh, and at least some basic communication was possible, uh, schools opened for perhaps two weeks, then there were winter vacations. Then came the COVID pandemic. and. Uh, 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 Again, the continuing restriction to 2G uh, at this point became really uh, uh, dire in terms of its impact on education because online classes could barely function. Uh, uh, most of the time they were snapped. Uh, you could not, you know, many students couldn't uh, even get online. Uh, and uh, this we found across the board in all parts of Jammu and Kashmir, this problem of 2G. And teachers, as well as students, were traumatized uh, by the inability, uh, for the students, the inability to learn uh, or to even see, you know, familiar, friendly faces. Uh, and for teachers, the inability to deliver uh, the kind of education that they uh, uh, wished to give uh, their students. I mean, teaching is a, like health, is a vocation. Still, it's not a money-making enterprise. Uh, so that, that, that I would say was tragic. Uh, doctors have told us how the rates of trauma uh, have shot up. Uh, stress, trauma, distress, disability, inability to function, uh, the, innumerable mental health problems from child to adult, uh, again, across the state. Um, now, looking at all of these, you ask yourself, uh, why? You know, what can be the possible justification for this? We hear uh, the Jammu and Kashmir administration, as well as the Union Home Ministry, saying that all of these steps were necessary in the name of security. Uh, that if these steps had not been taken, then figures for militancy would rise, figures <coughs> of, cro of terrorism, cross-border organization, and so on, uh, would all rise. Uh, I would only say that they have not really shown any substantive or convincing uh, evidence. It is true that figures for casualties have dropped by about 30% uh, compared to the same one year uh, preceding year of August to you know, 2018 to uh, June 2019. But that drop is not uh, uh, in absolute numbers. It's not a very large drop. We're talking maybe a couple of hundred. So if you look deeper into the government figures, what you see is that actually incidents of violence were dropping continuously from 2002 onwards. Uh, from a height of say, you know, 4,000 or 5,000 incidents 
uh, by 2013, you had come down to something like 150. Uh, slowly after 2014, those figures for violence started to rise slightly, but still very slightly compared to uh, the 90s or even the early 2000s. Uh, the only conclusion to be derived from those figures is actually that the impact of peace and dialogue processes during uh, the 2000s did impact in terms of bringing incidents of violence down. And there were two major factors. I mean, one was the dialogue uh, with all shades of political opinion, as the government put it, uh, in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, uh, and the other was um, the fact that the uh, security forces had adopted a hearts and minds policy where they tried, for example, to restrict cordon and search operations to the bare minimum. Uh, and to ensure that, uh, you know, orders that uh, the Supreme Court had uh, um, supported the army chief to give in terms of respect for human rights, that those were strictly adhered to, to the extent possible. I mean, security forces never adhere strictly to all human rights norms. Um, <clears throat> So, so these two factors together had contributed a great deal to the rise of uh, some hope for a political solution uh, to this long-standing uh, issue of the relationship between Jammu and Kashmir and the rest of the Indian Union. Um, however, what we've seen uh, uh, from 2014 onwards and certainly at a really accelerated uh, base in this last one year is that cordon and search operations, for example, have shot up in number. Every single day we saw for, uh, from the beginning of June to date almost, we have had a cordon and search operation. Whichever way you cut it, that is inevitably going to lead not only to an increase in casualties, but uh, even more seriously to a real alienation of uh, the population. Uh, again, I would say any one of us can imagine what it would be like to have suddenly, uh, you know, a, a number of armed soldiers come surround our locality, uh, start searching all the houses in some cases where there is strong evidence to show that militants may be hiding laying IEDs, uh, it is a very terrifying experience. And it cannot be something that can become a norm. It has to be rare if you want actually to, to bring uh, peace <coughs> uh, uh, in an area. Yeah, definitely. That was um, an interesting part of the report, how the complete focus on security considerations over the lives of the people is also significantly contributing to the alienation process. And another um, area of major impact is, of course, the Kashmiri media. So what were your findings on the media, on the independence of media, uh, considering the, uh, the, the effects of the new media policy and also, of course, the severe restrictions on internet connectivity? Well, uh, let me begin first with what happened in August. Um, with, uh, the, with the imposition of 144, snapping of all communications and so on, it was an uh, preventive detentions of 6,600 people, a vast number, uh, was that uh, protest was very difficult. Uh, and I did notice that the media actually expressed its protest by uh, refusing to publish for as long as two months. Uh, so that silent protest, I think, was quite important. You know, when people say, oh, there was no protest. The fact is that if you look, there was actually quite a lot of protest, some of it silent. Uh, uh, not only did the media refuse to publish, uh, uh, 
parents decided to boycott schools, uh, again in a sign of protest. So you had many instances of that sort. What also happened simultaneously uh, was that you had always had some degree of censorship of the, me of the local media in Jammu and Kashmir. Part of it was self-censorship. Part of it was that whether it was government agencies or whether it was uh, other funders, uh, they would often put advertisements only in those papers which they felt reflected uh, their point of view or praise their actions. So you did have that kind of problem <clears throat> earlier too. Nevertheless, you saw in the period from, let us say, 2002, two, three onwards, uh, quite a flowering of the media in Jammu and Kashmir. A large number of papers uh, were published and they had relative freedom if you went by the opinion uh, columns. You had every type of opinion being expressed. You had very loud criticism. Sometimes you had huge support for what we call separatist uh, uh, opinion. Uh, all of that just stopped from August 2019. We have not seen, I mean, it is astonishing that when you have a step as major as removing the special status uh, uh, of a unit uh, of, the, of the union, and then you, um, decide to divide it and demote it to two union territories, something that has not happened in the history of independent India, you would expect some criticism. The fact that there has been absolutely no opinion article published on these political issues is, is, is absolutely astounding and it can only mean uh, drastic draconian censorship. The new media policy in that sense substantiates that suspicion. If you read that policy, it is basically handing over uh, control of the media to the security agencies. It's absolute censorship. It's a disaster. <laughs> and it surely must be illegal. And yeah, like you, like you said uh, in the beginning of this question, how there were, how media is, of course, one way to resist, which has now basically been clamped down. And also with this heavy handed security approach and the clamp down on media. Now, what do you think are the avenues of resistance, peaceful resistance that are now available to the people? What, how do you think people can now resist? Well, I think that, uh, of course, I may be being terribly optimistic, but my sense is that it's uh, increasingly difficult to justify keeping the, the severe curbs and restrictions going in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, you know, Okay, first six months, you sort of say, well, we don't want protests. There are all these threats of terrorism and so on and so forth. But now you've had a year. Um, the COVID uh, lockdowns are easing all over the country. Uh, in any case, 4G has nothing to do with COVID. Uh, even this government <laughs> will not claim it has anything to do with COVID. Having an absolute security type administration is not sustainable. Uh, and protest has gradually mounted over this past year, if not within the state, certainly in other parts of the country, internationally, and so on. And so my sense is that, um, for example, more opinion, more critical opinion is going to be expressed now and it will not be so easy to simply arrest people uh, who are critical and charge them with PSA or UAPA or some other uh, draconian legislation. The courts are beginning to wake up to all the criticism on habeas corpus and bail. You must have seen that the media is now beginning to highlight 
uh, those issues, uh, the media, um, the national media. Uh, and so I expect that slowly we are going to hear more voices uh, from Jammu and Kashmir. It may only be speech. Uh, I would be interested to see if any of the political parties try to organize a gathering, what will be the response. But at this present moment, <laughs> because of the COVID lockdown, uh, it's difficult to organize a gathering. Though I do notice that the BJP, for example, is having gatherings. Uh, I mean, Mr. Shah, the Home Minister, seems to have contracted COVID at a BJP function. So uh, it's interesting that, okay, some people can have gatherings, others cannot. But that is a state that we have seen all over our country in the past one year. Uh, this is the, the 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 distinctions and the biases are very clear. Um, to go back to your question, uh, therefore, I expect to see a more at least public expression, maybe only through speech, maybe not through gathering. Uh, on the other hand, I think that all of us must also and quite realistically fear. Uh, that other forms of protest, for example, arise in militancy. Uh, again, you cannot indefinitely maintain the kind of tight security clampdown and presence that you have and that you have had for one year. This is not indefinitely uh, maintainable or sustainable. And I'm sure that even within the security forces, there are voices saying that. Uh, so if that starts to loosen a little, you can also uh, expect that uh, militant protest may also increase. And uh, that, of course, is a problem. It's a terrible problem, first and foremost, for the people of Jammu and Kashmir uh, to have to, again, undergo a period of militancy that had, was gradually beginning to disappear. Um, so I, I, I say this uh, with sorrow, that it does seem to me that this, this is a likelihood. Uh, of course, we all know that the best way to deal with militancy is peace, peace talks. Uh, the evidence is very clear to see. Uh, during the peace process of uh, 2004 to 2008, that's when you saw the really dramatic decline of violence. Uh, uh, and that lesson is so clear, that evidence is so clear, that even today, uh, were the government uh, to, to, to try to open peace talks, I think that, that you, they could prevent uh, a, a huge rise in militancy, but it's a very difficult task. And I don't see any inclination at the moment in this government to also wanted to know about the current recommendations that your report made, that the report of the Forum of Human Rights on, uh, of Jammu and Kashmir makes on how the situation, present situation, can be improved. Can you also talk a little bit about that just to conclude our interview? Sure. Uh, well, as you see, we have made 12 recommendations, which is uh, not too large a number, but large enough. Uh, on human rights, uh, on the classic human rights, we've said that uh, all these denials, uh, whether it's habeas corpus or protect preventive detention or uh, uh, you know, using draconian charges to silence dissent, arrest of journalists, uh, um, uh, minors, and so on, uh, that, that, that uh, we, that both the, the government should uh, release all who are still in detention and that the courts should deal speedily in terms of the constitution and the jurisprudence on habeas corpus bail etc uh, as well. Um, we have also said that minors under no conditions can be put in detention uh, which is the law. We have actually not said anything which is not the law. Basically, what we've said is please obey the law uh, uh, in letter, if not in, in spirit, to make sure uh, that, that these fundamental human rights are not violated in the way they have been. 
We've said 4G should be restored in toto. Uh, we've said compensation needs to be given to industries that suffered losses due to the uh, August 4, the what, what one may call the political clampdown. Um, uh, we've uh, talked about the need for, uh, uh, for children uh, to be given the kind of um, mental health care that the Supreme Court itself had ordered, but on which again, we have absolutely no information whether it has happened or not. Uh, we have raised the question of section 144, uh, which you know uh, uh, is never supposed to be imposed in a blanket fashion. Its district magistrates are supposed to take into account the prevailing conditions within the district and uh, 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 to be convinced of clear and present danger, not speculation of danger, but some evidence that actually shows real danger. Uh, and only then should they impose section 144. Now that principle has been violated completely for the past one year. You even have, I mean, government orders, JK government orders, saying all district magistrates may be uh, directed to apply section 144. That is not within the mandate of a home secretary or a chief secretary, that is only to be decided by the district magistrate on the ground. So, series of, of, uh, of those recommendations. Thank you, Dr. Adhikumar, for speaking to us today. And uh, that is all the time we have for today. Keep watching News Group.